I'm Mike Jordan, work at Machine Learning here, and I'm happy to start with Stephen Bates. Thanks, Mike. Um, hey, everybody. So I'm going to be talking here today about predictive inference for black box models. So roughly, you can think about this as how do I get confidence intervals on predictions when I do something like um, run a deep neural network? Um, so this is joint work with some folks at Stanford, um, Anastasios, Livwa, Jachendra, and Mike. Stanford. Sorry, I came from Stanford. Berkeley. Whoops. Uh, okay, we'll keep going. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about predictive inference. Like I said, um, the motivation here is, as many people have noted early, in earlier sessions, in these um, sensitive applications or, say, scientific research, when I use something like a deep neural network or some sort of black box model, um, the predictions that come out the other side, I, I need to know something about how reliable they are. I need to know something, you know, will they work on a future input? Are there error bars on them? And things like that. So that's the setting um, for the talk. I'm going to outline some techniques for doing that. Okay, so a key challenge here when we're working in this setting is that these predictive models are very complex. So if you look at something like a state-of-the-art neural network, it might have you know, 60 to hundreds of layers. Um, this image GPT, a transformer model, has 6.8 billion parameters. So these models are really, really massive. And the question, are, the question is, you know, how can I work with such an object to get statistical guarantees? Okay, um, so when I'm working with this really great um, predictive model, can I just ignore the uncertainty that's coming out of these predictions? And the answer, I don't think I need to convince you is absolutely not. Um, can I fall back on maybe simpler models where I do have a richer toolkit for predictive or predictive or statistical inference? And the answer is, you know, no, a lot of times these great complicated predictive models have the best prediction accuracy, right? So if you really want to squeeze out every ounce of prediction accuracy, you're in an image task, say you're going to want to use something like, um, you know, image GPT. Um, so what we're going to do in this talk is we're going to kind of build a set of tools that wrap around these black box models. You can think of something like cross validation. It's kind of a meta procedure that goes on top um, of a black box model. And we're going to use that to get these statistical guarantees. Okay. So the sort of paradigm we're going to be working in here is we're going to change the game from returning point predictions to returning set valued predictions. So in a simple classification task that might look like this, so this is a um, uh, classifier trained on ImageNet. It's uh, a ResNet. Um, and in this particular task, I'm showing you confidence sets that are going to come out of, uh, uh, of techniques like I'm going to show you. So for example, on this image, it turns out it's a pretty easy image. Um, and my neural network knows that it's a squirrel, so just a squirrel. Um, on a more difficult image, like this center image or this right image, you're going to return sets that are of non-zero size. Again, it's a confidence set or a confidence interval. So for example, on this moderate image, it's a little bit of a harder image because the squirrel is um, at a weird angle to the camera. It has kind of a slightly strange background with other distracting objects in it. So in this case, the confidence set that's going to come out of this routine that I'll show you is fox squirrel, gray fox, bucket, or rain barrel. Okay, so my um, network in this case is saying, I can't tell you for sure which of these labels is the correct label, but I'm pretty sure it's one of these. Okay. So again, just we've changed the format here. So I'm set, returning point predictions to returning confidence sets. Okay. Now, um, it turns out we can do this in a way that gives you good statistical guarantees, and I'll elaborate on that throughout uh, the rest of the talk. Okay. Um, so I just showed you a pretty simple um, prediction task. It was just a classification task. So the right answer is just one of some finite number of labels. We might want to do something similar kind of for a whole suite of machine learning problems. And so uh, in this work, what we do is we kind of extend this confidence interval paradigm to work for a large number of loss functions, or you can think about them as statistical error rates. So for a lot of different learning problems, we can kind of define these loss functions or statistical error rates. And then we can derive predictors that work, say, on top of a neural net that satisfy, um, that satisfy these statistical error rates, that control some statistical error rate. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is a segmentation example. So what you input to the network is say an image and what you output, what you want it to output is a, a subset of the pixels that corresponds in this case to a tumor, okay? So you had some ground truth data um, and then you fit a network on it and you want it to output um, these sets. What we're gonna use as our kind of notion of statistical error rate in this particular prediction task is the false negative rate. So I might, I might ask you to give me these kind of sets of prediction, predicted tumors. And, you know, I might want to kind of certify that I got 90% of the tumor pixels. Okay. So this is a false negative rate. This is an example of a uh, error rate that we can control. Okay. 
It turns out we can do this with finite sample guarantees, kind of precise guarantees I'll show you in a couple slides. It'll work with any predictive model, which is to say we can build it on top of, you know, a black box neural network, whatever that happens to be. Excuse me. And it will work with any distribution. So you don't need to posit um, regularity conditions on the underlying distribution of, say, um, images of tumors in this case, or colonoscopy images. The only kind of assumption underlying the inference is that you have some IID sample from a population. Okay. And in particular, as, as I said before, we're going to work with sort of a general set of statistical error rates. Okay, I should say I'm working in this kind of general field of conformal prediction. Um, it started in kind of the late 90s and it's recently been kind of revived in statistics and machine learning and elsewhere. Um, and there's kind of this general set of tools, or at least a there was a more limited set of tools that were sort of generalizing in this talk um, to handle this problem. Okay, so the setting here, uh, this will be the heaviest slide with notation, don't worry. So the setting here is I start with some predictive model. It could be a neural network, it could be something else. And I'm just gonna take it as a given. I'm not gonna try to understand how it's working. I'm just going to kind of feed in inputs and outputs and learn something about how it's working. But there's no assumptions about smoothness or whatever that object is. I'm gonna take some fresh data that was not used to train the predictive model. And I'm gonna use this to kind of add one extra layer on top of it. So I'm gonna use this to add my confidence intervals on top of the neural network. So I had some fresh data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build a family of set valued predictors. I'm going to call these T lambda for lambda in capital lambda. Um, and they map inputs, which live in script X, to outputs, which live in two to the Y. Remember, I changed the game to return outputs that now live in kind of the power set of, say, the label space of the pixels. Okay. So you should think about this as kind of a low dimensional statistical model. In fact, it's a one dimensional statistical model that I built on top of my neural network. And that's the only thing I'm going to be manipulating. Okay. And then these last two lines here are kind of introducing notation for um, the statistical error control. So I have some loss function. So you give me a ground truth and a prediction and I assign some loss to that, you know, kind of pair of predictions and ground truth. And I want to control that quantity and expectation, which we'll call the risk. Okay, so the form of error control that we can get with this talk is a uh, sort of a high probability guarantee. So the user is going to choose two parameters, gamma and delta, that are informing what this error control is. And you can train um, this family of set-valued predictors, or you can select one element from this family of set-valued predictors, such that it satisfies the following property. The probability that your risk exceeds this threshold gamma is less than delta. Okay, so I picked, um, I picked a risk threshold gamma in advance, and now I'm promising you that you don't exceed that too much. Okay, so if I wanted a false negative rate that was below 90%, I can get that most of the time unless I see a really bad training set. Okay, so just to visualize, the risk of T is a random object because T is gonna be some random function trained on data. It has some distribution. It's too complicated for me to know exactly what it is. However, I can promise you that I'm picking it in such a way that you don't fall to the right of gamma too frequently. Okay, okay so this is the notion of error control that we can achieve. And I'll kind of show you how to do that very briefly on the next couple of slides. Um, first, just to internalize this definition a bit more, what, what do we get in this tumors example? So this is a, a real example. There's about 8,000 um, tumors. And I ran this simulation experiment where I select 1,000 of them for training. And I use the remaining for um, validation. And here's the histogram we see across the different runs of what is the false negative rate that we get, OK? I wanted a false negative rate of um, 0.1, and I only wanted to exceed that a small fraction of the time. And you can see that's exactly what we get. So this 0.1 corresponds to this vertical line, and I don't fall to the right of it too often. Okay, so unless I got a little bit unlucky, the final predictor that I return to you satisfies that notion of error control. And you can see the sets we get in this example are pretty good, and they're pretty tight around the ground truth. Okay, so where's all this coming from? I'll just sketch it very briefly. So let's look at this center panel. What you do is you had this one dimensional family of predictors that you built on top of your neural network. Okay, it turns out you can build it in such a way that the risk is monotone in that parameter. So um, the Y axis here is the risk. It's like the error rate that I'm trying to control. The X axis is this parameter. And I don't see this black curve. This black curve is the ground truth that's only known to nature, but I estimate this ground truth black curve with some data. And that's what I'm plotting in gold. 
Okay, so the gold curve is a upper bound. It's a conservative estimate of the black curve. It's based on data. And the property that it satisfies is it's an upper bound with probability one minus delta. Okay. I'll note that it's only a pointwise upper bound, so it's a pretty weak property. I'm not demanding that the whole curve is an upper bound. It's just a pointwise upper bound. And so you can get this from data from various concentration results, including, say, Huffing's inequality or more modern variants that are um, sharper. All right. Okay, so this is where it comes from. The procedure is pretty simple. You just look at your upper confidence bound, which again came from some data, and then you stop at your desired risk level gamma. Okay, so I'll show you one example and then I'll skip to the end. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you a multi-label classification task. So in this case, the Y is a subset of one to 80 and I have a predictor that spits out a um, kind of predicted probability for each of the classes. Um, my loss again, I'm gonna use the false negative rate. So I wanna return sets that contain most of the true classes. Okay, you can see here what some of the sets look like. And then you can also verify in simulation experiments that you are getting that error control that you asked for. Um, I won't have time to tell you about some of these other details. You can do it on complicated tasks like protein structure prediction. Okay, so um, in summary, uh, I work on these predictive inference problems for a lot of kind of machine learning tasks. It turns out you can get really solid statistical guarantees even when working with things like these complex deep learning models. And roughly you should think about this as I did some low complexity statistical task on top of the neural network and I can control that last step really precisely. So that's how I can get something like finite sample guarantees and finite sample confidence intervals. All right. Um, thank you all very much. Question? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the the number of samples you need for the calibration step is something like 500 to 1000, roughly speaking, it will vary with the task, but that's kind of the order of magnitude you should you should think of. As far as how many samples do you need to train the model? That's just totally application specific. Um, in all the kind of simulation results that I sketched here, the size of the calibration set was 1000. So there were a thousand extra points that you use to train the confidence intervals. All right, thank you.